tonight and um, from here. Um, fuel theft solutions. It um, started a number of years ago when I was uh, an owner driver. I had my own trucks and basically I was returning back to the yard one night and what I found was basically a guy taking cans out of the cab and loading them into his car. So obviously you have to got the cans out to case you clear the cab out. Um, and that sort of woke me up to the fact of fuel theft. How do you deal with fuel theft? How do you control fuel theft? And what um, methods and issues it causes and how you can mitigate the risks of fuel theft. Um, simplistic um, is diesel dying. Um, I thought about putting a dye in the fuel, um, mark the fuel separately, um, make it a colour that you can't go out and buy. So in terms, if someone is caught with that fuel, the question is, is first of all, where have you got it from? How do you account for it? And secondly, you know, at the end of the day, through employment law, you don't have to uh, prove something, you have to believe something in order to start the process of disciplinary. Um, we've been in and around the industry um, for in excess of 20 years, um, working with the haulage industry primarily. Um, it's been effective, it, it's worked. I mean, what we've found is fuel thefts is it's the highest category of crime in freight, and as expected um, with the inquiries that we were getting um, in preparation for the removal of incitement to the red diesel coming in April, um, we expected that crime to head towards the construction, quarry, demolition, and recycle industry, and it has basically. It's it's gone. We, we saw an initial 40% jump in fuel thefts. Um, what we have seen, as well as we have seen uh, damage to plants. Um, the, the associated environmental costs from the police are called, the first thing they do is call an environment agency, and then you're talking the additional costs of what we call, you know, the indirect costs of what we call the iceberg effect. Um, we have worked in a number of fields. Um, in 2010, we were called in um, to Afghanistan by a company called Arrow Petroleum, and basically, um, under Operation Enjoying Freedom, um, you were suffering substantial fuel losses. Um, what we did is we put the dying program in place to render the resale of fuel. Uh, so basically the companies and the US military weren't paying twice for the same time of fuel, which was pandemic. As a result, the dying program with the Office of Inspector General, um, 53 um, US servicemen were convicted and incarcerated as a result of that directly. The finance bill in so, 2002 and the removal of entitlement is, been a headache. I mean, when we were at Hillhead, for example, the level of approaches that we received at Hillhead um, was quite concerning. It's quite worrying that the industry has basically had the rug pulled from under it. So where you were using red diesel, there was a deterrent in red. Uh, people were still willing to take red. Um, now it's white. What we've seen is we've seen increases in fuel car misuse at the pumps, where we're seeing people filling vans up um, through the side doors of vans. And we're also seeing, you know, barrels as being repositioned in places where you can extract the fuel um, away from sort of, you know, the site control office and stuff like that. Um, I can only see the issue getting worse. Um, there is various solutions and products on the market, such as anti-siphons. But the only concern is uh, with the anti-siphon devices you've got is when you sort of go into work on a Monday morning and find that it's sort of siphoning, it's been smashed off. What you're walking into is metal fragments in the bottom of your fuel tank, and then effect it so it's a machine shut down so it's a full clean through. Um, crime is, is, is rife. I mean, at the moment, on freight, we're running at over 40 million so far this year. Um, that, the estimation is it's fivefold with all the indirect costs of that. Regarding plants, um, we work with an organization which you would hope you'll be familiar with called NASIS, which is National Vehicle Crime Intelligence Service. So what happens is with us, um, if, um, for example, the police come across blue fuel, we are notified. And what happens then is we look at who we supply and support in that area. And subject to obviously the theft being reported, we can be able then to sort of try and put a, a, a location and a crime into a criminal and from there. There's other um, solutions that are out there that I'll just sort of briefly highlight. Uh, and technologies that are out there at the moment. Um, what we are seeing is an increased use of drones. Um, drones are being used uh, to survey uh, remote areas where the operators can be, you know, so many miles away. 
And with that, they're able to survey the ground uh, in relation to CCTV, tank locations, and basically site layout from a safe distance, let's say. So basically, they're mapping it out in preparation for uh, potential crime being committed. Um, in addition to these drones, we've seen the use of uh, wireless CCTV systems, albeit they are good, and they're good in their own extent. The problem is, with them being a wireless system, these can be easily overcome with what's called a GPS jammer. Uh, GPS jammers are not illegal to buy, but they are illegal to use. Um, these GPS jammers range from about £30 um, off the internet. You basically plug into a cigarette lighter. Lawful uses of them are to say stop uh, contraband being dropped into prisons through the prison service and um, the US well, military operations where they're doing disposal or bomb disposals to basically stop any sort of triggering of the device. However, illegal uses is they knock out wireless CCTV systems. What they also do is, uh, if you've got a black box fitted on a car, it thinks the car's still at the location of the home, so that's the last signal that's transmitted. So basically you've got people, and even more worrying, um, what we found is that there is a potential now that people who have been tagged by the bracelet, an ankle bracelet, it can actually think that they are still located at the last known address before the GPS channel was activated. Um, there is technologies out there for the detection of these jammers. Um, I don't want to go too far into that at the moment because obviously these they are, they are effective and they do work. And it's it's basically it's resulted in a considerable amount of plants being recovered as well as uh, high performance cars before they left the country. Um, simplifying diesel dye, I look at diesel dye blue as a new red. It's a cost effective solution. There are other products out there, um, on markers and dyes and things. The problem with markers and dyes is, as soon as you put um, a marker into a fuel, in addition to a dye, you've got to look at your OEM approvals, because a lot of these we found with some of these OEMs are, we're trying to dig in initially saying, we don't want anything popping in, um, to a fuel that could affect the performance, is it an additive, it's not an additive. The difference is, a solvent blue 35 or 79K, has uh, been used in, across Europe in Estonia, Sweden, <coughs> Latvia, uh, Portugal, in rebated fuels and created fuels. So it's, it's, it's in use in plants and machinery across Europe, but not until now it's been used in this country. So there has been resistance. Obviously, you had to go through relevant tests at the start of it with HMRC, but it didn't um, affect any sort of prescribed markers in the fuel. But obviously now, since the Euro markers were removed from the, the rebated fuel in 2015, um, it's been replaced by what's called an Accutrace S10 molecular marker. This behaves quite similar to the fuel, and therefore it's unable to be detected uh, within the marker field. So it's, it's much more difficult to remove because you can't see it initially. So yeah. Uh, now, cost of living. Um, we've all felt this at the moment. Uh, cost of a tank of fuel, how it's gone. and. Um, with that, um, there's a lot more concerns through internal risks, basically. Um, we're seeing this now, um, where people are believing, um, companies that are dealing with it, they are concerned that their only issues they believe are internal from contractors and that's their own employees. Um, anything from the cost of food, fuel, energy, it's all having a compounded effect, it's putting pressures on people. And sadly, when people are faced with pressures, we tend to look for an easy option, which potentially is through their employer and what they're providing, which I think is fuel. Internal risks, we supply anything from the dye, from advice, um, to the uh, fuel extraction bottles, which in their own fuel testing unit use. So basically, we found these effective. So what you've got is you've got um, a site agent would have one, say, hung up in his office, and that in itself serves as a deterrent that basically at any time that, that agent can go out and sample the vehicle. What we say to people is, is when you um, implement a diet program, what we say is review your HR policy, which will incorporate the extraction of the sample of fuel for evaluation stroke analysis. That way, it's, it's part of the search policy that you know, they're committed to, and that way there's, there's, there's no argument, basically, if they're on site with your commitment allowing that to happen. Um, simplistic um, diesel dive, it's worked in a number of engines, it's worked in anything from power generation when we worked with the mining companies, when we worked in a mining company in uh, Africa that suffered, suffered um, a substantial fuel loss to the point where it affected the share price. Um, 
we work with Newmont, Barrick, um, in the Tarpon Mines. That's where we just sort of found it initially. Um, fuel theft is rife out there, and it's obviously going roadside as well. The fuel theft in this country, as I say, from April we've seen a um, forty percent like initial jump. Um, we expect that to increase further with the nice drawing in and the increased pressure to the cost of living. Um, it's not good news. It's not good news for an industry. Um, there is. Um, it's my opinion and our, our sort of you know theory on this is keep it as simple as possible. Uh, make the end product worthless, and that's the only thing you can do with a dime. It's difficult to resell. Um, like I say, I mean you're dealing with um, a various level of criminality in this. You're dealing with um, people that are operating from you know a can that's going in a van that uh, basically the people then that are coming over a fence that are operating say from remote sites um, with uh, transit vans and so forth up until you're talking to more organized crime groups which we've seen an increase of which are targeting more stock tanks um, which are running sort of HGV trailers with uh, 1,000 litre intermediate uh, bulk containers in the back so basically you've got these 1,000 litre IBCs in the back of these vehicles and what they're using, we found that they're using um, TVA pumps, which can transfer fuel at 120 litres a minute. So it doesn't take long um, to move that level of fuel. And it's it's not good news, basically. It, it, I, I can't, you know, sugarcoat something that's like good. But, um, you know, as much as you can do that there, I would advise people to use hardwired systems on CCTV. Um, regarding the wireless systems, like I say, they can be compromised through GPS channels. Um, You've got to, so from our perspective, you've got to make the product unsellable. And if there's a product unsellable, i.e. if it's gone into the person's own vehicle, there's traces of that like there would be with red. If they try and resell it, we found that um, it quickly becomes news that someone's selling a blue fuel because you can't go out and buy it. So, and obviously the risk is then of the staining. Um, we found that the blue diesel stops internal thefts in its tracks. And obviously from the theft of finding and working with mouses, like I said before, when they come across um, blue fuel during, say, a nighttime roadside stop where there's a vehicle that's either marked or on it, we get notified and then hopefully we can link that fuel to a location and then, you know, fingers crossed to go from there. But sadly, at the moment, we're looking at about a 1% uh, prosecution rate on fuel thieves. Um, it's not good. It's um, The Home Office are currently working on a piece at the moment with regards to fake crime and encompassing fuel theft within that. Like I say, highest category of crime in freight, it's going to cope. It's, it's mirrored over now into, into construction and mining. And there's, there's, no, there's no sort of magic wand on this. And I can't see any way that this is going to go better until security levels of security are put in place. I mean, what we're seeing is uh, near to me, can't name the company, uh, they were targeted. Um, they drilled a hole in the tank, they parked an articulated vehicle on a main dual carriage road, making out it broke down. Unfortunately, they targeted the vehicle, the tank, the stock tank before April, and then uh, they took 50,000 litres over the weekend. So this is basically the ramp pipe that measured for about 150 litres. I think, I believe the highways agency went out to, to see if they were okay, and they just carried on working. And that was a well-known uh, retail distribution company who have on-site security that patrol every hour. And they're able to go on site, cut through the fence, drill the tank, and bump it out. So, yes, security is good, um, but it's all about the end product which they're after. And you know, I can't sort of emphasise enough. You've got to look at an option of sort of potentially blue or any other colour that's approved of being the new red. Um, you've got to differentiate the old fuel from the guy up the road. And um, I mean, this uh, Hawley um, Murray Hog that was targeted not so long up this way. I think they took 12,000 metres and they ran the pipe across the field and they even got the, the truck on the CCTV across the road. Um, but sadly, that's not been recovered because at the end of the day, it's finding you not to be seven. It's once, once it's in another container. The worst thing that the police can do at the moment is what's called theft by finding. And to be honest, if that was to go to court, well, it really wouldn't go to court it, because it's, it's not substantial enough. It, it, they could have beyond reasonable doubt. And to be honest, if they can't prove it, they can't prove it. It'd just be thrown out like an evidence, to be honest. So that's roughly where we stand on that. Um, cost effectiveness of diesel dye, it's um, from shot bottles to um, IBCs, 
So shop vault, for example, is what we sell to like your browser people, your construction site people, where basically they're using these little transfuse um, deliveries up to a thousand litre, 100 mil goes in, 100, 100 per parts per million, up to stock tanks where one litre treats up to 10,000 and beyond, if you want to make the chefs out a little bit further. Um, it works out basically uh, from five litres you can die for a penny. So in the scheme of things, it's effective once it's in the fuel, it's in the fuel. Once it's mixed in the fuel, so if someone's put blue fuel over the white fuel, it would be a lighter blue, but it's still distinguish that that fuel is blue, and obviously, you know, the difficulty is just proving where you have had that fuel from. Um, we have had success, we have had prosecutions, um, we've done statements for the police that have gone to court. Sadly, um, companies we've found tend to run out of steam by the time it gets to court, and they're quite happy um, to take a resignation rather than allowing it to go all the way to court, um, because obviously they don't want the risks, you know, um, tribunals and things like that, that to get something wrong in the process and everything like that. So we found that we've sort of gone down, we've supported the police, um, but, um, you know, for whatever reason be, the, the, you know, the, the councils, for example, have found that they don't want publicity around this and what they've done then is they just allow the person to resign and sort of crawl away, basically. Um, the level of damage to tanks, it's, you can protect your tank, we found, as much as you want. Um, but the problem is, is the power tools that we've got nowadays, the, the sort of cordless power tools, you know, just come in and these tower power tools just go to a tank in, in minutes and seconds. Some of these tanks now are coming across on construction of plastic, so therefore it's easy to drill. And we're seeing this now with the uh, refrigerated transport as well, where they're drilling, they're going under the trails and drilling the tanks. It's only 240 litres, but the, dis the realistic cost of that is you're looking at potential, you know, temperature rejection, which is, you know, 40, 50,000 pounds worth of food. So over, you know, 240 litres of diesel. So where do we go from there? NASIS, we work with NASIS, we cover Europe as well. Um, we work with uh, organisations called TAPA, which is Transport Access Aspect uh, Protection, um, which covers Europol and Interpol. Um, we developed an app as well. And say, for example, in the last week alone, we've mapped over a thousand crime locations. Uh, these are various crime locations where people have sadly got CS gas put to the face, they've had unknown substances, they've been threatened with knives. And this is happening in this country, and sadly, things aren't as actively reported as they could be. So, okay. At this point, has anybody got any questions? Who? <laughs> You, you say that you know you you you, you dose a tank, yes. and then you can add fuel into the tank undosed, so that the, the color disappears over time or is diluted. I think is better. Yeah. What level of detection can you go down to? You're looking at probably up to a threefold. So in, in realistic terms, you could probably dilute it down twice afterwards, and you can still be detected in the fuel. But so obviously less... It's less visual, but obviously, I mean, if someone was wanting to make their dye go that a little bit further, with obviously the increased costs of fuel, etc. There is the availability to that. But what we what we initially do is we look at it at 100 parts per million, and basically it's, it's a strong, distinctive blue colour, so it's a no-brainer. So when someone goes without suction bottle and squeezes the bottle and it extracts the fuel, it's blue. It's, it's, there's, no, there's no question. And is blue the only colour? Customs next has a very strict in this country. Uh, it's comes under the hydrocarbon oil marking regulations 2002, and it's 14 section 3, where it's any prescribed mark and colour. So basically, you can't add anything to fuel that could potentially alter the characteristics of the fuel. So what we've had to do is we've had to have the dyes tested, evaluated that it didn't affect any prescribed markers. And in theory, yes, you could use a colour or any colour, but the difficulties you've got. Uh, using colours um, is how does it affect? So, for example, I know I know of another company um, that are manufacturing um, or supplying a green dye, for example, and they've made quite an active out on this. But well, sadly, within the marketing, it was noted that it said it's um, it resembles the Republic of Ireland rebated fuel, which is green. So that's fine. Um, but the problem you've got there is if the road fuel testing unit turn up on site. And they see a colour a color that looks like an Irish red, which is green. The first thing they're going to do is shut the site down until every vehicle's been tested, so we know that it isn't related fuel. And from a compliance perspective, I would anticipate that those sites would be revisited. 
What's happened as well is um, we've done a piece of border force as well with the Northern Ireland Protocol. What we found as well is there's been a, a twofold increase in shipments going from the Republic of Ireland um, to Wales, basically, to Pembroke and so forth. If you remember from sort of many years ago, there used to be a main uh, smuggling route through Liverpool for fuel. That's now the concern is now because obviously the strict sort of control measures that are in place now that that may go now to Wales. And obviously that's being monitored at the moment. So to supply a potential green product, I would personally have to hold my hands up the steer play like that because I think it's a kind of way in doing stuff. What if you had um, to put white diesel on top of red? And you've got like a rosy coloured diesel, you put the blue dye in the colour of the chain. Right. First of all, um, there was a there was a, a company, a petroleum company in Scotland that hadn't washed the tank out and they'd done red and they got fined a quarter of a million pounds. So basically what you're doing is you are you're not allowed to impede the, impede the identification of pre mark fuels to debate which is red. Um, so basically you don't remove red. So it's this is what the fear and construction has been that you know the machines go out with white and we've got to come back with white and you know and people are changing fuels and obviously when the higher machinery, you know, is it going on agricultural, is it going out in construction? And that's a concern, but it's something that's got to be policed. I mean, when I was at Hellhead, for example, I was talking to a, a fuel tank supplier who was actually unaware of the law. And he's you know, he's email over sense and basically I've, I've given him my point of contact in HMRC and basically he's been very lucky. Had he got caught out, he, he basically been on all the vaccine sort of thing. So he's been lucky, but what we say is don't go near it. Mm -hmm. Don't try and mix the two at all, you know what I mean? And don't put any product in. Because in theory, what you're doing is by having white diesel into red, you're potentially diluting the market. So they could that could be said that you're trying to impede the market by diluting it. Even though you dilute it, you're right, it's obviously always have to pay. So it's a bit of a sticky wicket. Mm -hmm. And the road fuel testing, if you've ever come across them, they're not the most friendly to people. And you're not getting diluted in at the suppliers before it's delivered. We work with a company, um, yes, in Harlow called New Era. And the problem is, is what we found is the issue you've got then is you're potentially tied to a supplier. Um, so what we've got is we're dealing with this sort of end users, basically. You then have got full control of where you source your fuel from. Um, what we found is, is we've had sort of various companies, fuel supply companies that sort of try to come on board. And then what the drivers have, have dug in saying, you know, look, um, we're not handling chemicals, we deliver fuel, that's all we do. So, and then go and try to go down the union path and so forth. Um, but, you know, some companies are embracing it, and there's certain large companies that are embracing it. Um, but it's something that we, we're we more of something sort of that you stay in control of your fuel. You know, I mean, you control, you control your measures. At the end of the day, you know, you can only police something so much. How do you know that product's actually gone into the fuel? Because the problem is it will only be added to the fuel when it's been dispensed. And that's the only thing is it's when it's the agent. You will, I don't believe you'll get a company that will turn up with a box of dye and just take it in. Because obviously it won't go into the tank because it's more any contamination in the tank. Um, so basically the issue you've got is it's still going to be controlled at site level. So that's where your control measures are going to be in place. I mean, the thing is, the problem you've got is, is also if your issues are potentially internal, you're now looking internally to control it. So it's it's, it's difficult and it's, it's one to control. But what we've got is we've got guys who are going around um, for a well known construction companies, and what they do is they've got the suction bottles and they turn up on scientific machines to make sure the fuel has been marked. So they're doing random compliance on the site to make sure that the fuel in that barrel has been marked is going into machinery. And that's that's their way of policing it. And what's happening is it's the sort of turning up by the Gestapo, and it's basically there's that level of concern when they turn it up. Um, they, they've said we've had thefts off a couple of sites, but considering they're only 230 sites, they are quite pleased with the end result. They, they were concerned at the level of theft that they were going to encounter, and they believe that the, the concerns are external rather than internal. Because what they're doing is they're making it they're going in on the site and testing the field, they're making it very obvious. They're getting the site agent out and the sort of hook where he is, and they're taking it to the machine and they're going to the machine and quickly. I mean, obviously, these, these pipes are what the uh, HMRC use, and they've got like a, an eight foot pipe with a five gun bore, and it will go into any tank basically. So, mm -hmm. anything from a transit van down to a car, and basically, it's, it's what they're sort of putting at the roadside. So, they are effective. It's a quick squeeze, it draws the fuel up. If it's, if it's blue, you've got it. 
at least it creates fear sort of thing, and that's you know that's the way it is at the moment. So if you're going to use it on the road vehicles, do you get permission from Customs Nexus? We don't actually need an authority. What we do is because we're known to Customs Nexus, um, we give an authority to use. And basically that's so when customs pull you over outside or something and they're both testing you or they turn up on site. What we say is make them aware that you wouldn't use our products. We're known to the road full testing unit nationwide. We can verify that you're off as a problem, but to be honest, there's been no problem. And I mean, a number of years that we've worked in this country, we've not encountered any problems uh, outside. I think it's 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 one of those, it's, it's new territory for, to, you know, the quarry and then construction industry, the dies and the panic that's been associated around the fuel. Um, and to me, looking at construction, um, I'm seeing guys that are being robbed um, where they're sleeping in a vehicle and they're physically, you know, they're sort of ripping the sending units off and the tank, tank units and or the guys that sleep six foot away. So it scares me that when you've got potential plants that's been left on Saturday lunchtime until Monday morning, you've got to, got, you've got to sort of look at this and put control measures in place because obviously, you know, people are coming in on Monday morning and they're walking into sort of Armageddon really and obviously you've got machines that are stuck because obviously it's damaged the machinery. So. There's no questions coming from the the ether. And the fuel that raced back to where it's supplied. We did we did this. Um, the problem is it's there's a product out there. We, we do detect a dye, right? Which is a DNA-based dye, and it is usually unique friendly. But the problem you've got with that is, is it's attracted to plastic. So the DNA, the synthetic DNA, is drawn to plastic. So if your machines have got plastic tanks, you would not potentially get accurate reading. And the problem is, is what you've got is you've got the generation of a synthetic code, you're looking at approximately up to 4,000 pounds, and you've got the administration of that. So realistically, you're looking at a potential cost of three and a half to four pence per litre. And to be honest, I don't think that's a pill that, you know, quarry can stomach, to be honest. I mean, a quarter of a pence or a fifth of a pence, it's negligible in the sense of if you're protecting your tank fuel, but when you can have an increase, you know, 4%, it, it's, it's gut wrenching, to be honest. So there are products out there, but it's not it's not cost effective. You were saying about it being one percent kind of conviction rate for fuel theft. What which I think the best way to say that, what would make it that it was possible for conviction? Because you were saying it's such a low um, what would make it the bar that you could actually prosecute on? What would you actually need? We were oh, sorry. Look at us. We were at the police at the end of the day. Um, <clears throat> with the police, it's lack of funding. What, the, what they're more reliant on at the moment is, is targeted intelligence. So they rely on their ANPR and stuff like that. So if, if a vehicle has been suspected and it's been reported, what they do is they then put a marker onto that vehicle and basically that vehicle is then tracked through the network. The problem you've got now is the amount of vehicles that are running around on clone plates. So <laughs> what they'll do is they'll obtain plates from a vehicle, from a dealership that's, you know, and stick them on their vehicle, they'll drive into it past AMPR, they'll commit the crime that they're doing, they're in and out, and basically what you'll find then is that the place has been taken off, so even when the AMPR has been activated, they're looking for a different vehicle. I mean, it's sad news. We've seen it on industrial estates where, you know, these guys have got in and they disable street lamps. They took the street lighting out to give them more, you know, more cover, basically, and then this is the level of criminality that these IBCs, that this, they're going off with sort of, you know, 26,000 litres of time. You know what I mean? And, and it's quick and they're moving this fuel. There's been no clear breakthrough in this country with regards to um, organised crime groups and fuel theft, which is concerning in itself that the amount of fuel that's been illegally sourced, let's say, it's not popping up. So it's not popping up. I know that to, you know, fuel receipts through HMRC, it's not being detected. So, I mean, at the end of the day, there must be haulers running around on fuel, solid fuel, and you know, I mean, the amount that's going, and it's like, why is it not getting flagged? That's that's something that we're looking at. So, but at the end of the day, the police are proactively. I had a conversation um, with the DCI yesterday. The police are proactively looking at fuel theft and are going to be looking at um, basically including all forces now on regular updates on fuel theft and what we're doing with fuel theft because what we're looking at as well is separating that fuel because obviously we've got freight and what happens with freight 
because with construction and quarry and so forth, you sit at the moment, you're sitting target, and I know that you know that, and you know it's not it's not good basically. And the police know it, and they're limited on the availability of resources that they've got to try and deal with something. And you know, they, they're saying that the hands are tied at the moment because obviously there's got to be the level of crime um, to justify the sort of resources being put into something. The problem we've got is there's a high, well, we find there's a percentage of crimes that um, don't report it because the employer they always minimal um, crack on. I can't imagine it's still around waiting for crime reference, so there's crack on. Um, on a social media platform, I set an account up and set a group up. And so basically, what the aim was is I found that it's just over 12 months ago, and I found that the first thing is, is if someone does something wrong, the first thing people do is reach for the phone. You know what I mean? You've got to, you've got to make an image of that and a recording of that. And in over 12 months, we've now hit 18,200 members. So basically, I look at that as we've got that many sets of eyes on the road um, and about that see things that are suspicious and they get reported. And then what they do is message me direct, and basically what I do is I personally follow up with Nazis to make sure that they've got that intelligence. And it might be something trivial and not relevant, but if that vehicle gets stopped, he's got to keep having his hand. You know what I mean? I'm not bothered about that, but at the end of the day, if it's got drums of fuel in the back, it was worth it. And that's that's how I look at it. And we are saying we work closely with Nazis, we're classic trusted partners. Um, we've got a strong relationship, we do information sharing, so I get reports off them on fuel thefts. And we also supply uh, data in on them on fuel thefts, potential thefts. Um, so it's good, but it could be better, and it could be a lot better. So. These, these fuel teams, they must have a quite big infrastructure that stores fuel and tanks. And, you know, yeah. Or do they ship it that quickly? They don't really need to put it in a holding tank like that. Might to be honest, I think the majority of fuel, it's moved initially through IBCs, and because obviously they're just. For if you don't, then it's thousand liters, thousand liters. So I think they, from a distribution perspective, that's easy. Mm -hmm. I don't think they put in stock tanks. Um, but this is all, but it is organized crime. This isn't so that people, you know, driving a van, jumping over the fence at a weekend. These are guys that go in quick. If you, you, you evaluate the location, you know exactly what's there. They know, you know, you might even know, you know, when you have a fuel delivery, you know, what I mean, they'll, they'll monitor something. And, and it, it's, it's a scary world. I mean, the targeting, you know, you guys have got your systems, you set systems in your security systems, but you know, at the end of the day, the, the targeting places the CCTV is security guards. But because what's happened is, is primarily with the fuel, you've got this big 80,000, you know, 100,000 litre tank, oh, just get the corner out of the way. That's how it's always been, it's been in the corner out of the way. You can't have it in the yard at the corner. And then the vulnerability is on the far side of it. You know, the, the power tools they've got now, just just straight through it. So you were saying the dies on this base. Once you actually put it in your tank, so they drill the, the, the storage tank in, are they taking it just white diesel? Your storage tank, yeah. If you got a big storage tank on site that's yeah. full of white diesel, yeah, you said the dye is all dispensed once you actually press it, press yeah. the gun. No, 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 no. No. The dye is dispensed. So, say if you've got a 40,000 litre tank, yep. you're having 30,000 litres delivered. First time you're marketing, four litres go in pre delivery. No one takes any draws any fuel off that until that delivery is being completed. As the delivery is going in, it's agitating, oh, really? and then it's fully mixed. So everything and then that comes out through that stock tank is mixed. So if you if you drill the tank, top the fuel, it's blue. It's blue, right? Yeah. Okay, got that. Without getting overly contractual, now you deal with your clients. Um, if you know somebody has used your product and, and ends up with a theft, does your after service come as part of the service? The, the tracking and the tracing and the, the answering of the questions. We can only, yeah, I mean, what well, basically, um, we can only work um, with intelligence as good as it is. So to report it to us, we will report to analysis. Analysis will report to Police Scotland. So at the end of the day, it's this will happen. Um, there's certain days that are more prevalent for fuel theft, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, don't ask me why. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why, but it seems to be, you know, crime seems to be at a certain point, to a certain time frame. Um, there is certain locations uh, in the country which will be classed as hotspots, which are certain locations that are regularly targeted. And it might be something as simple as where a police force overlaps another police force. So the patrols go to a certain point, they go back to a certain point, and that's the target point. So there's no sort of active patrols actually going past until it's reported. So there's no sort of drive by intelligence, let's say, from the police forces. But from the support that we offer, if it's reported to us, 
we can progress it down the chain. And we do liaise. I mean, I'm, I'm in email contact with NASIS every other day on stuff that's going on. I'm, I'm continually sent um, photographs of things that's happened, and we fold that data in. Because obviously, when it comes to us, it tends to have been within 24 hours, and that's you know that's live. Whereas what happens is the problem you've got with some police forces is by the time they've got the data and they've sanitized and sent that data to NASIS for the mapping, it could be three or four weeks ago. And by that time, multiple sites have been targeted in that area. So, so you see the use of your product is much be much more preventative than 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 um, responsive, if you like. So so when when guys on a site understand the products being used, you know, that's the basis of the business that they know they'll get. Um, they're not going to be taking white diesel, it's going to be coloured up. I mean, the thing is, I mean, like, the positive response we've had, we found that any internal issues has been stopped from scratch. Because obviously, the, the issue is now is, you know, if you've got blue fuel in a can in the van, if you've got blue fuel in the, the van or anything like that, where's it come from? And you've got some explaining to do. And like I said earlier on, um, with employment law, you have to prove something, you just have to leave something to start the process, and that's that's what you need to do basically, and that's what does happen. Do you promote it on site for signing and stuff like that? Or? In addition, it's basically, we don't want someone going into the machinery and sort of smashing the way before they realize it's fluids of no use. So, what we say is we, we say to people, put their decals which are supplied on, on the browsers and on the plant, basically to warn it's in use. And obviously, put some perimeter signage up as well to sort of basically warn people that come in from the outside that they say moves. So, yeah. But like the smart water technology, mm -hmm. yeah. whatever yeah. that is. <laughs> well, so smart water is a DNA base, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a DNA base. Yeah. Cool. Well. It's all quiet on the internet front. So. So, so, okay. uh, Guy mentioned the uh, so make some say white with uh, red. Are you saying that you know at the end of I don't know actually deal with shows, I don't know, but at the end of you can uh, there's no longer longer tax for if you have say half a tank of red, you have to use all that and clean it out before you can then use that tank again, usually. Basically, I think the advice of customs next time I spoke to you um, was basically run your tanks down. So in the case of it, I think it's sort of the, the memo they put out is don't get excited and start bringing your tanks prior to April because we're going to start monitoring it. So, what they're saying is basically run your tanks down, we'll allow that, but obviously, then you, you don't know on to white then. Um, but obviously, the concern is like with plant suppliers, browser suppliers, if you can use an agricultural and burn and supply them and it's red, white, red, white. Um, that is a concern basically because it's the eventually sort of legal threshold there. You eventually, you know, if you had a small bit of red, it is going to obviously color, color the diesel, but the more white you're going to put in, the less the less acceleration is going to be. Yes. Um, but with your blue, if you put blue on that, what, what would you have? I couldn't support use of blue on red, because technically then you could say you're trying to mask the identification of a pre field. What we'd say is, obviously the difference with the marker is before, it's, it was called the Euro market, which was not used from 2015. Um, that was a printed in the market with the yellow 124. That was replaced by Accutase S S10 market, which is a molecular market. Um, the Euro market was detectable at parts per million. The Accutase is parts per billion. So they can really sort of see the level of dilution. And basically, that's mobile labs. They've got the vehicles and it out to do that detection. So, yeah. Mm. So it is detectable even at that level. But I mean, if it was in minute detail, you'd get away with it. I would, I would say you would get away with it personally near as way, but obviously, as time goes on, you want to see that sort of dropping on. Yeah. Any more questions? Thank you, Christopher. That's a very enlightening topic, uh, one which is very topical at this moment in time. No cost, extortionate. Going up and down all the time, and it's not as if they're going down, staying down, staying down, and then rising again. And it is a big concern for industry as a whole, and uh, not only for themselves, but for our customers. We don't see that cost for them to transfer into something. Um, so, again, that affects the whole sales issue. Um, to protect it, yes, there are other ways. I mean, there's Cameras or Daleks, so was a different thing, but to actually have a marker in the fuel, 
which we then said fuel has hours and can be traceable. I think that's a, a better point. Um, and I don't know whether anyone within the, the audience tonight or from our satellites would be interested in taking up with that and offer up a presentation to the company themselves. <coughs> so, all I can say is, uh, Christopher, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you very much.